As John said, today is the last of our series, uh, this short series called Songs for Life, and uh, they've all been taken from the Psalms. So we started with a, a song of choice, which was Psalm 1, and we followed that with a song of worship, Psalm 95, and then Ron brought us a song of anguish. It is all of life, isn't it? Uh, Psalm 6. And so if you've missed any of those, you can find out about them on the website, no problem at all. So today's Psalm 23. It's probably the most well known passage of Scripture. I mean, there, there are well known verses, I understand that. But as a passage uh, of Scripture, this is probably the best known. Now, not just I- I for people who go to church, but people outside of the church too. And you most likely heard it at times of grief. And um, somebody's read it, or at funerals, you may well have heard it then. And that line, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, or the darkest valley, you know, that will be the line that lots of people pick up on. And, and hence, um, people take it from that, that position. But if, let me just say, if that's your experience, I'm going to ask you today, will you please come with fresh eyes? Because I think if we just used it as a psalm that's for funerals and grief, I would do a gross injustice to this psalm. So let's turn our Bibles to Psalm 23. We're going to read this aloud. This is the NIV version. Uh, The words will come up behind me. And if you haven't got that version, then can you just read this one? So (laughs) we haven't got 55 different versions going on all at the same time. Psalm 23 and... uh, First one, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is a great psalm, my friends. It's terrific. You know, I think we're conditioned to hear this just for comfort moments only, but it's far bigger than that. Do you know, there's a, as you read it, it's a powerful affirmation of who God is and, and, and what he is like. And therefore, we call this a, a song of peace. But I suspect you could call it a song of confidence and peace. David doesn't hold back. There's an immense declaration of who God is. He doesn't hold back. He puts it right out there. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is strong. It's affirmative. And you'll find this is incredibly personal. My shepherd. We can have a belief in God. And I don't know, you know, when I come and I, we have many visitors. And I don't know where everybody is coming from on this. I'm glad you're here. But, you know, we can have a belief in God. Even come to church. And he can still be distant. Now, for some, the order and the detail and the intricacy of creation and life, it just makes a God or some being plausible for some. They can't, they can't go with the random stuff. There has to be something behind all of this. And therefore, God can possibly be a concept, a, a backcloth to life to make life make sense. But let me just say say this. This is not that God. The backcloth God is is, is not the God here in the Bible. And and David, he he, you know, you you'll find that this God can be known, and not only known, but it can be known personally. Hence the Lord is my shepherd. And we'll go on a journey on this arm. I won't cover everything, and there are places to visit. They're going to look at everyday places. 
Now, for a shepherd, everyday place, it will be, will be green pastures, quiet waters, everyday places. And then there's dark places, darkest valley, the valley of the shadow of death. And then we'll go to dangerous places. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That's a dangerous place. So we're going to pick up on these places as we go through this morning. Green pastures, quiet waters, everyday place for a shepherd. That's what a shepherd and sheep would do. This is their everyday life. Now, I have to, I, I understand this. You know, High Wycombe, Hazelmere, actually, they're, they're, it's, we're in commuter belt. You know, people are going to London from, uh, from here, and it's basically urban, and yet it's in close proximity to the countryside. I understand that. And what we, we can go and have lamb, we can go and see lambing season. You know, you can go to farms and see lambs being born and all of that. And, and I know it's in close proximity, but in general, for the people that come, we, it's, not our, it's not our life. We don't, it's, not, it's not what we really know. So it's a little bit foreign to us. And then when we think of shepherd and sheep, we probably end up with pictures like this one. And uh, you know, because we tend to think in our own context. So you go to shepherd and sheep, they are fluffy, like, fluffy white sheep and... And then it's the shepherd, and he's smiling, and it's rolling countryside. And, and then there's one man and his dog follows that, and all the rest of it, you know. But in its original context, it's nothing like that. Middle Eastern terrain is very different. It's more like this. It's rocky. It's barren. It's dangerous. It's unknown. In a place like this, you need a shepherd. I mean, you need to know where you're going. You want to find green pastures, you need a shepherd. They're not everywhere. You want water, it's not everywhere. You need someone who's going to navigate your way through all this stuff. And yet, in one sense, there's nothing unusual about this. This is their everyday place, and this is their everyday routine. It's the bread and butter of shepherding, Providing for ordinary ongoing needs of the sheep. Now, in, in truth, everyday routines are where we spend most of our lives. We will all have great challenges at times. And we will, even, even this moment, even today, some of you will be experiencing a, a terrible trouble. But in the general warp and woof of life, in the general routine of life, we live the everyday stuff. We don't live soap opera lives. We're not part of the part of the East Enders cast, you know, where the end of every episode da 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 da, da leaves you with what's going to happen next. It's, I mean, we don't live like that. I mean, if we did, I mean, we uh, exhaustion's not the word to be quite honest. We can't live like that. We live much of our lives in the ordinary routine which is challenging enough. Amen? It's challenging enough. We get tired. We may not get run over, but we get run down. Uh, We may not get zapped. But but we do get our energy sapped. We suffer from wear and tear. And Jesus knows exactly what that's like. He knows exactly what that's like. Jesus came in the flesh. We, we know that. But sometimes what we miss out is that most of his life was a carpenter. That was his life. He knows the ordinary stuff. He knows the ordinary life. And when Jesus is ministering, Matthew writes this in the gospel. He records that uh, when he, Jesus, saw the crowds... He was moved with compassion because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Do you know, that's part of everyday life. And we're pressed and urgent and there's this and there's that. Harassed and helpless, not really know where we're going, not know what is the point of me being here. 
But we love him not because he meets us at crisis moments, but because he meets us at everyday moments of our life. So I want to talk just about that. Every day has its own challenges. Jesus said each day has enough trouble of its own. <laughs> he knows that. <laughs> yeah, we have challenges. In our culture, we have opportunities today for travel. We have opportunities for education. We have endless opportunities for our children. I mean, you could drive your car like a taxi all over the place for your children. I mean, the opportunities are endless. And leisure. It, it, it's, it's full of stuff. And it's incredibly busy. So people understand our culture as very busy. It's incredibly busy. Now, endless opportunities we have to fill our days. Let me just go down one tack. So one Christian writer was in a conversation with a couple of men who were talking about their struggles with the internet. And when we're thinking of that, we'd probably go down, oh, they've got problems with pornography or whatever. No, nope. they're addicted to social media. That was their problem. They were spending hours and hours on blogs and mindlessly surfing the web. It was an addiction. Couldn't get off it. Nicholas Carr in his book, The Shallows, reflects on how his attitude changed towards the net. Um, this isn't the book, but Kevin de Jong is writing about it and he this is Nicholas Carr's reflections he loved the speed of the internet the ease, the hyperlinks, the search engines the sound, the videos, everything and then he gets a sort of a a moment and he realizes that the net had control over his life in a way that his traditional PC never did his habits were changing morphing to accommodate a digital way of life. He became dependent on the internet for information activity. He found his ability to pay attention declining. At first, he said, I figured the problem was a symptom of middle-aged mind rot. But my brain, I realized, wasn't just drifting. It was hungry. It was hungry. It was demanding to be fed the way the net fed it. And the more it was fed the hungrier my mind got. Even when I was away from my computer, I I yearned to check emails, click links, do some Googling. I wanted to be connected. Now, Kevin de Jong, who writes this book, Crazy Busy, says, really, I thought it was just an excellent piece in here. He said, I've noticed the same thing happening to me for the past few years. I can't seem to work for more than 15 minutes without getting the urge to check my emails glance at a blog, or get caught up on Twitter. I wonder if you're the same. Just a thought. He said it's a terrible feeling. We see this in everyday life. Two people sitting at a table in a cafe or a restaurant, just the two of them, and they're engaged with their phones. And so they have their phones, and they sit there. I've watched this. And it's not just a cursory glance to see how Leeds got on yesterday. Thank you for asking, by the way. They won. Uh, But uh, it's not just a cursory glance. They're on there for five minutes. Oh, no, no, no. They're on there for ten minutes. Oh, they're on for 15. I've watched them. I've watched them. I'm thinking, my goodness. Why did you... Why did you come out? Why did you come out? Engage, not with each other, but with their phones. There seems to be this insatiable appetite to connect. Listen, hour after hour, day after day. Kevin DeYoung says, We're always engaged with our thumbs, but rarely engaged with our thoughts. We keep downloading information, but rarely get down into the depths of our hearts. That's a great line here. And then this artist, he does this presentation of um, photos. And uh, in each of the photos, he's got people in a, in a, uh, at, a, at a certain posture. And he's just taken the, f- the mobile phone or the tablet away. 
Can I just wonder if we could show that? I don't know how we got into the bedroom here. I, was just, I, I don't understand that. Too. I mean, <laughs> but you can see the hand there. That's phones. And then the next one. Is this reminiscent of any families here? I just, just a thought. And the next one, please. <laughs> wow. It's not marriage. Hey. And then the next one. That's the whole family. Okay, thank you. Um, my friend's everyday life is full of stuff. What are you going to fill your life with? What are you going to fill your life with? You're making the choices of how you're spending your time. Your time, you're making the choices. Find the time. But you can't keep doing this stuff. This will drive you nuts. And what's more, it'll make you hungrier. And you'll just want more and more and more. You'll feel you've got to be connected to this thing all the time. Some people check their emails last thing at night. You must be nuts. I never do that. But So don't bother emailing me, emailing me by the way. I never do that. Nor do I do it first thing in the morning either. I just give myself a bit of space. So find the time. You've got to find the time because... He wants to lead us beside still waters and to green pastures. And we have time. Time is not, <laughs> time is not elastic. It's inelastic. It's inflexible. You, you, it's in your hands. No matter how high the demand for time, it, it will not go up. It's limited. So how you fill your life, everyday life, you make some choices. Important for you. Don't think this is just a young person's game. This is middle-aged people in here talking about the internet. They know what this is. So all I'm saying, I, I, I download stuff, I use this. But don't let it use you. The net life can be, make us very shallow. No, he makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside quiet waters. The shepherd knows, the shepherd actually knows how to create green pastures and still waters. Sheep do not like busy water. It unsettles them. Busy stuff, it unsettles them. The shepherd would go and he would, he would go to certain places uh, uh, and he would find certain places and he would till the ground and remove all the stones and he would plant the seeds in and grass and he would, he would look after that for places to bring the sheep to. And with water, he would, he would you know, block off the streams or whatever and, and, and find places where they'll make rock pools where the water was still because the sheep do not like busy waters. They're unsettled. Shepherd leads the sheep to quiet waters because because everything gets so busy. A few weeks ago, I was awake in the middle of the night. It does happen for me, I'm afraid, at times. And I'm I, my head is like a bee's nest, a wasp nest, or whatever. You know, I wake and I I'm not one of these people who sort of tries you know wakes up a little by little and I wake with a load of things all in my head. And, um, and I, I couldn't get them out. I went downstairs, went into another room and lay down. And I started thinking about this psalm. He leaves me. He makes me. He restores. It's everything that he does. And I'm sort of in this half sleep. I don't know if you've ever experienced. In fact, it's almost like a three-quarter sleep. But I know that it's, I'm almost there, but not quite. And, and, and then the sort of sleep, half sleep, whatever, I, I see this picture of a hand. And it's an inviting hand. Just a beckoning hand. And I could see my hand. And, and I moved my hand to hold this hand. And this peace just came right over me. And this reassurance. There was nothing... There was nothing uh, pushy about it. It was so gracious, so kind. I instantly walked into that place of peace, reassurance. He leads me. Besides still waters, 
He makes me lie down in green pastures. Please give him the time to do this. This is everyday life. Psalm 68 verse 19 says, Praise be to the Lord, to the Lord, to the Lord, to God our Savior, who daily, daily bears our burdens. So he'll be there for us tomorrow. And on Tuesday, God is working for us. I mean, he is for us. He'll be there for you on Wednesday. Thursday, he'll be there, not just in your darkest days, but in every day. He has promised to do that. I'll never leave you or forsake you. We normally pull that out when things are not going well. No, in the good times and the bad times, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And he's faithful, my friends. He is faithful. Mark Buchanan says that faithfulness is very much underrated. And he has this quote. He says, faithfulness is the most amazing and yet the least captivating trait. It is by definition predictable, habitual, and routine. You have a sense that he almost puts dull in there, but not quite. He says, it's the substance of things expected. Expected so unthinkingly that we now take them for granted. And then he goes on to say this. It is the one quality in the cosmos we cannot live without. Faithfulness. Our God is faithful. Everyday faithfulness. Everyday life. I think it's die actually. I think you, you put me onto this book. Was it The, the Life of the, the, uh, the Liturgy of the Ordinary by Tish Harrison Warren. It's a, it's a great little book actually. And the, I'll just give you the chapter headings. This is a life in the ordinary. Waking, making the bed, brushing teeth, losing keys. Just raise your hand if you've ever known a moment like, yeah, just a few of us. Oh, the rest of you are very good. Um, fighting with my husband. I don't know that one. Uh, sit, sitting in traffic. Calling a friend. Drinking tea. Just every day life. God will meet us in it. Will we look for him in it? He wants to meet us. It's a lovely psalm, this, you see. And then he take, the journey takes the sheep to dark places. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. As if for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. So I don't know if you've ever read this psalm and you've realized that how personal the vocabulary is. There is, you can look through this again, but there's no we, or us, or they, in regard to people. It's not in here. There's only I, or me, or my, or he, or you. That's how it is. It's pers- so personal. You can't get it any more personal than this. For you are with me. I, do you know God like this? I wonder if you do you know God like this. He's wonderful. And the first three verses are, are spoken as if it's to you or to me who are reading it. But then in this, this verse, everything changes. You see, you can't go talking about the shepherd for too long before you're talking to the shepherd. For you are with me. You see how it changes? For you are with me. He makes me. And now, for you are with me. It's a real change. David knows that the life is... Not all green pastures as well. Still waters and he he knows that. He has enough episodes. This man has enough episodes in his life about the darkest valleys. This man was hunted by King Saul. You know, read the story of David. Hunted by King Saul. I mean, he lived in caves and caverns and uh, uh, caves and, 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 and in the wilderness. This man has his wife given to another man. I always found that so difficult. Wow. This man has regrets. This man has disappointments of the way he's led his own life too. He knows darkest valleys. As painful as they are, I'm just saying to you, don't discount the darkest valleys. They will shape your character. They will bring depth to your life. They will strengthen your faith. There are things you'll learn in the darkest valleys you'll never learn in green pastures. Don't knock it. Don't ask for it, but it'll come. 
But I'm just saying, there are things you'll learn in these places you will not learn anywhere else. There's nothing like walking through valleys to bring change in your life. Joseph Scriven was a, uh, well, he was born in 1820. He's educated in Belfast. And the evening before he was due to be married, his fiancée died. And I don't know if it was that moment or before then, but he consecrated his life to Jesus Christ. Following that, anyway. And then for some for particular reasons, he migrated to Canada and a long life's way he got engaged to another girl uh, who weeks before they were due to be married, she became ill and she died. This man gave his life for the poor. He helped physically handicap people, those who are uh, mentally in turmoil. He helped, I mean, he's just such a great help to people. He receives this message from his mum, telling him his mum was ill, and he couldn't get back to Dublin where she lived. So he wrote her this poem. And these are the words. What a friend we have in Jesus. All sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. What peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we did not carry everything to God in prayer. How many songs do we sing that are born out of the place of the darkest valley? Blessed be your name. When I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. I mean, you have been there Des and I have been there. Des and I have stood sometimes at the center on some occasions, broken by life, tears running down our faces, and we're singing these songs because we know other people have been there too. Our God is faithful, and he'll be with us in the darkest place. And if you notice about this psalm, it's all about him. People talk about this psalm and all they do is talk about the sheep. There isn't any chat about the sheep. It's all about the shepherd. Everything is about the shepherd. I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now the staff would be that that crook. He's got a crook on the end. And and the staff was used to prod the sheep and, and put them into place and perhaps hook them out of trouble. Apparently they wander and... um do daft things. So that, 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 that's what the staff did. But the rod, and we've got the picture of the rod up here. The, 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 the rod is a stick, and this is the end of the stick. Now, it, it's, it's quite thick, the rod itself, and, but the end is a great, thick, knobbly end here, and it was often two to four feet long. It was put in the belt of the shepherd and when trouble came and when predators came, out came the rod. I mean, you got hit with that. You knew about it. You knew about it. You got a right clout with that thing. I mean, it, it, it does the job. It really did the job. You know, our, our Lord, by the way, he's, he's no em, emaciated weakling. Our God is a warrior. No flat-capped, thermos-carrying shepherd. He fights for his people. He fights for you, my friends. And God set the Hebrew slaves from Egypt free. He didn't sneak them out. He didn't do that. He smashed their oppressors. He exposed their gods as frauds. He drowned their army in the Red Sea. And on the other side of the Red Sea, all the people of Israel sang, I will sing to the Lord. For he triumphed gloriously. He hurled both the horse and rider into the sea. The Lord is my strength. Our God is a warrior. Amen? He is a warrior. For you are with me. And then you read in Romans 8. It's an exact mirror of Romans 8. You know, If God is for us, who can be against us? I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, height nor depth, anything else in all creation, we're able to separate us from the love of Christ, from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. For you are with me. David's eyes on the shepherd. And he's a warrior, my friends. So pray. 
Pray. Don't pray to us. He's not an emaciated weakling. Pray to our God as a warrior. And you think your prayers are so tame and they don't do anything. And then if you look into Revelation chapter 8, you see these prayers going up to the, to the throne room in heaven. And my good there, goodness me, there is some stuff going on there. There is some, you want to read it. There's heavenly activity, there's peals of thunder, there's rumbling, there's flashes of lightning. God's at work. So get on the case and pray. And don't think they're, they're, they're tame or worthless. He hears everything. He'll either change you or he'll change circumstances, but he'll be in it. Hallelujah. So our God at work is a warrior. And we're in a battle, my friends. Everyday places, dark places, dangerous places. And now I just have to squeeze this last bit in. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That's a fearless talk. I mean, that's fearless talk, isn't it? We're going to come to this meal. And when you come here, you'll get a small piece of bread and a little bit of juice. And you'll think it's all so small, but the promises are immense. Promises are immense. Meals had huge significance to Jewish culture. I mean, when you come to this meal, it's, it, you just do this in remembrance of me. It's, it's relationship, it's acceptance. Covenants were made at meals. Danger is right near. It always is. It's even threatening. Fearless talk. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My enemies. So what? Ha. You're going to put oil on my head. That's refreshment. And it would, it would uh, be perfumed. And your cup would never overflow. I mean, it would never be empty. It would always overflow. And God has moved from a shepherd to a host. And anybody who comes in and comes to this meal, my goodness me, they're well looked after. There's nothing in short supply. Nothing in short supply. We take this meal today as a sign and a promise. Jesus gave thanks. He took this bread. And he's looking forward to the following day. And he knows it's coming. He said, this is my body given for you. Given for you. Take this. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he takes the cup. He says, this is the cup of the new covenant. This is the new wine of the new covenant. Drink this. It's, this is for you. Given for you. Provided for you. He says, we come to this meal. Oh, small things, but immense promises. Grab hold of the meal today. Grab hold of God's presence in the meal today. Jesus, given for you, body broken for you, on the cross, battered, nailed. And at that moment of darkness, which is a sign of God's judgment, the judgment of God came upon his son that you and I might have a, a, a life that overflows in him. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. He emptied himself, Philippians 2 says. He, he became nothing. Why? So that you would have everything. Hallelujah. It's a great meal, this. Oh, it's just a little bit of an ingredient. It's immense promise. Come and take it. Come and grab hold of it in faith. The Bible tells us he died for our sins. Whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And the curtain was torn in two. And the most holy place was no longer separated from you and me. It's wide open. Come in. Have the meal. Is this a new covenant meal for a new covenant people? Let's get a hold of it. We're a people of faith. So come to this meal knowing that Jesus made a covenant with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He's God who is so faithful. Everyday places, dark places, dangerous places. Amen. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now that's a forever place. Perhaps another day. But it is a forever place. And that's your promise, my friends. Enjoy your meal. Amen.